We can see him. Okay, great. So here we go. Um, so I'll try to keep this to about 45 minutes so we have some time for questions. Please uh, put questions in the chat. Um, often th the, the stuff that I bring up just brings up questions about what's happening at your own center and I'd be delighted to talk about that. I will warn everybody that this is a little bit more clinical than some of the uh, talks that you've been getting. Um, uh, we'll have uh, plenty of data, uh, but really want to talk about CAR-T and pediatrics. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm taking the uh, perspective that we sort of led the way at the pediatric uh, community, the pediatric cancer community, the pediatric cell therapy community led the way toward the first FDA approval. That was three years ago. I'll talk about that process and then talk about some of the things that we've learned since then now that a lot of people are doing this. So that's sort of the intent of the uh, talk today. Here are my disclosures, uh, lots of names here, but the only one that really matters is I do receive both research support um, and uh, uh, consulting income from Novartis and Novartis um, actually owns the uh, therapy that I'm gonna be talking about today. So, you know, for those of you who know a lot about CAR-T, this is review and the, for those of you who have heard me speak before, it's really review, but um, just to get everybody sort of on the same uh, level of thinking about this, uh, this is what a, a CAR-T setup looks like. Uh, obviously stands for chimeric antigen receptor, that's what the CAR part means. It's a way to force T cells to recognize cancer cells and kill them, that's what this all boils down to. Um, you can get super heavy into the immunospeak and I'll try to avoid doing that, but I think there's some parts of how this work that really matter. Um, so first off, T cells don't rec naturally recognize cancer because cancer is self. Um, second off, this approach, which puts this CAR molecule, if you look, the cell on the top is the cancer cell, the cell on the bottom is, is the T cell and the uh, CAR molecules inserted into the T cell genetically. And you see key parts of this. So the blue green construct, is the recognition construct. It's just a piece of an antibody actually. Now this is an important point because you can only recognize surface structures with a typical CAR. Uh, even though T cell re receptors and natural T cells can recognize epitopes from inside the cell, the only way you can recognize anything with a typical CAR is by using this uh, binder approach that just sees stuff on the cell surface. So that's a big difference between a natural T cell recognition and a CAR T cell recognition. On the other hand, the great thing about this is that anything that you have a monoclonal antibody to, you can make a car out of, but beware. Uh, so CD19 is the target we grab in ALL and in lymphoma, but the, and that works out great, um, but uh, there is no ability of a CAR T cell to tell the difference between a malignant cell and a non-malignant cell, unless you build up a complicated multi uh, antigen recognition structure that really isn't fully clinically implemented at this time. And so uh, uh, ALL has CD19, but normal B cells have CD19 and we kill both ALL and normal B cells with our CAR T cells. And that does have some uh, longer term consequences or at least one. Uh, on the inside, <clears throat> We have the pieces of the T cell activation machinery, CD3 Zeta, which provides the initial T cell uh, activation signal, and then 41BB, which provides the, uh, sec uh, the secondary co-stimulatory uh, licensing signal that T cells need for full activation. Um, other folks have used CD28 as a different co-stimulatory domain. And this is sort of the standard design. This is what people sometimes refer to as a second generation car although that, that uh, uh, terminology is going away. But right now, what's out there in the, in the um, FDA approved and near FDA approved world is some variation on, on this. So uh, Carl June likes to call this uh, a, a 20 year overnight sensation, um, which is exactly right. Uh, the idea of CAR T cells actually began late 80s, early 90s um, as a, a way to use synthetic biology to get uh, T cells to do what you want, to recognize what you want, to ideally kill what you want. Um, you know, it wasn't even called a CAR back then, but the, the, the idea existed. The um, approach to it got a lot more sophisticated. And it's fair to say that this was an amazing idea, but there are multiple clinical trials in the 90s and early aughts that really didn't show much. Uh, we could make cells, they look great in the test tube, we put them in the patient, nothing happened. No toxicity, no response. Um, and, you know, people are like, okay, this is a phase one trial, but, you know, in this field, we actually want to see responses in phase one. It's the only way we know that this is actually worth going after. So 
the current manufacturing process um, really has two goals, which is uh, proliferation and persistence of these T cells. So what we do is we collect T cells from each individual patient. And I'm going to talk about, uh, if I have time, allogeneic CAR T cells at the end of the talk, but these are autologous. So we're making them from the patient and that induces all sorts of uh, complications, not the least of which is we have to fully qualify every single lot that we make for every single patient for every single use of this therapy. And that's, you know, you make a vial, you get a vial of cefepime off the uh, pharmacy shelf. Uh, they might have made a couple kilograms of cefepime in that lot, and they had to qualify that whole lot once, and then they could distribute it all over the world. This one patient, one lot, one qualification, one release. So that, that is complicated, but we can do it. So we, we take uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells just from a routine white cell apheresis, just like you would for stem cells without mobilization. We then, uh, we can freeze those cells and we can get them way ahead of time, months, years even ahead of time, if that's what you wanna do. Um, we then thaw these T cells in a GMP manufacturing facility. Uh, it could be at the University of Pennsylvania, could be the Novartis commercial facility, could be any other company that does CAR T cells, could be your own GMP facility. Thaw the cells. Then we hit the cells with a vector, a viral vector. In our case, it's a lentiviral vector, which is a crippled form of the HIV virus that can't replicate, can't cause disease, but can modify T cell genomes very effectively. Then we have the CAR gene in the T cell that's expressed on the cell surface. And then what we're hoping to do is derive an interaction with the cancer cell that does a couple things. One, it kills the cancer cell. Otherwise, why are we bothering? And then we also want the, the, the uh, CAR T cell to proliferate. So I'll show you what that looks like. And we have to have proliferation. Proliferation gets you in remission. And then persistence, the ability of T cells to remain for months or years, uh, is important in maintaining remission, especially in leukemia. And we argue a lot about how long these T cells need to kick around, but our data suggests that around six months is uh, a reasonable time frame. although we have many patients who've had these cells in the body and functional for years. One of the main reasons, there are probably about two reasons, but they're the, uh, the main reasons that this works now and it didn't work before is we learned how to make the cells right. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but basically this is a, a uh, all of these steps really depend on understanding T cell activation in a way that we probably didn't um, in the 80s and 90s and we do now. And um, uh, one of the th things we do is we provide both of those signals, I mentioned signal one and signal two, to the T cell using beads in this case. That may not be the only way to do it, but it works great. CD3 and CD28 antibodies that activate the T cells. And uh, this is just how you do this. It takes about uh, 10 or 11 days to actually manufacture the process and then another week to release it. It's a three week manufacturing process. You can expand these cells enormously. Importantly, they retain earlier T cell states, stem central memory, central memory T cells. Those are the ones that stick around. The, the terminally differentiated T cells are great killers and they look awesome in release assays and they are wonderful in the test tube for two days. But we want something that's going to last for months or years, and there you need that younger T cell phenotype. And one of the big changes in using this kind of manufacturing is that we maintain these T cells with amazing proliferative capacity. And that's one of the key things to making this work. This is the kind of proliferation that we're talking about here. Um, so this is just, if you look in the red box, those are CAR T cells. These are just CD3 positive cells, so all T cells. You inf infuse the patient, you don't see anything. This is all in the blood. And then the cells start to spill out two and three weeks later and 70% uh, or so of the cells are, are CAR T cells. So this is antigen driven cell proliferation in a uh, lymphodepleted patient. Um, and, and so what we have patients who half their circulating white cells or more are CAR T cells. So this ability to proliferate is enormous. And it's really all or nothing. You get good proliferation, you go into remission almost without exception. You don't get proliferation, you don't go into remission without exception. And uh, these cells can last uh, actually now out to nine years in pediatrics and 10 in, in adults. So this is just what this looks like. Um, this is just a, a, a video showing the, the, the green cells are leukemia cells and the gray cell is it's a CAR T cell. And you see that, gray cell come in and then hit that leukemia cell. And then that bubbling that you see is the destruction of the cell membrane. And this is another reason why this works as well as it does. It 
you know, the CAR T cell doesn't care if the cell is chemo resistant, if it has bad cytogenetics, if the patient has relapsed five times, if they had a bone marrow transplant, doesn't care about any of that stuff. It just kills the cells. And just as an example, um, our data show that there are, if you look at cytogenetic abnormalities that convey high risk, uh, we don't see any difference in outcome in patients who do or don't have like pH positive or anything like that. Do we have individual numbers of patients in each cytogenetic abnormality be able to say that for each one? No, we don't. They don't have enough patients. But overall, there's no impact of unfavorable cytogenetics and the likelihood of going into remission. So things really start get really get going in the early uh, uh, you know uh, 2010s. Um, uh, the group at uh, Penn uh, that we work with, led by Carl June, initially showing responses in patients with the adult disease CLL. Then our first responses in ALL, and then the the sense that 90% of the patients were going into remission, and that these were sustained remissions. Uh, this is uh, published 18 months later. Um, and this was very exciting, especially since a lot of these patients uh, were not going uh, to transplant after this therapy. So we really focused at our hospital. There's a lot of discussion about that. I'll talk about it very briefly. Um, we really focused on not transplanting as many patients as we can. And there's strong disagreement on that, but we do what we do. Uh, 2017, I'm not going to talk about this at all. Uh, uh, very important uh, clinically, these uh, two products uh, doing uh, trials in, in uh, DLBCL, same products. Uh, one is the Kite product, Yescarta, and then uh, this product that I'm, I'm talking about, that which is called CTL019 at Penn, and now commercially approved as Tisogen Leclucel or as Kimraya. This was a study I'll show you some data from. This was the registration trial in kids. This was the first this, this followed on the first multi-site trial that we also did in the United States. Uh, it was the first international trial and the first to use uh, uh, um, company manufacturing uh, for a, uh, a pivotal trial of a CAR T-cell product. I'm not going to get into this in detail. This is sort of hardcore information for people who actually do this, but this is a complicated process. And for people who are used to sending patients for bone marrow transplant, we don't think about it the same way. So that's an important thing to know as a referring uh, position. We're not trying to get the patients into remission. They have refractory disease. It's, it's a high cost to get somebody into an MRD negative remission for transplant. We don't want to pay that cost. We just want to keep the disease under control. Uh, so we decide the patient's appropriate. We collect their cells and we actually can collect those cells in advance. Uh, we say, hey, this is a high-risk patient. I'm not sure I'm going to get them to transplant, or this is a high-risk patient. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to get them into remission. And I'll just collect the cells in case I need them. And we do that. And sometimes they don't need their cells and we're fine with that. Then we give them the minimum chemotherapy they need to get them to the, uh, the end of manufacturing. Now that has changed completely. When we started this, you could be waiting three, four months between uh, collecting cells and getting a product back because there was such limited manufacturing. Now, especially in pediatrics, because we are privileged and because we are first in the queue, I have to admit that's true. Um, it's you know typically less than 25 days 22 is the absolute minimum that we get a product back. And so you don't have to do as much during that period when the period is so much shorter. That was really helpful uh, in doing this. We don't want them in remission. So if they come in with 5% blasts, we're delighted. I'll show you the impact of, of disease burden on a lot of things. So that's great. Uh, we worry about using antibody treatments uh, directed at CD19 and CD22 for various reasons, splenitumumab and endotuzumab. If people are interested in that, they can ask about it. And after they get their infusion, guess what we do? We leave them alone. We don't give them chemo. We don't give them interthecal chemotherapy. I'll show you why we don't. We don't give them tyrosine kinase inhibitors because even if they have pH positive disease, they seem to do fine without them. And the TKIs can actually interfere with the CAR T cell function. And we try to stay away from steroids as much as we can because obviously that could eliminate the, the CAR T cells. So this was the pivotal trial. I'm not gonna go spend a lot of time on this, but um, this <laughs> kind of eight, two and a half years of my life, uh, I was uh, enormously privileged to be the head of the study steering committee with these uh, docs at 25 centers, 11 countries around the world, Canada, US, EU, Japan, Australia, shipping cells over oceans, learning how to do this for the first time, 
Um, I mean, it was an, an exhilarating uh, and perhaps somewhat scary experience because these were outstanding docs in great centers with strong cell therapy experience, but almost all of them had never seen a CAR T cell patient before. And so we were all learning this together. There was a lot, we were interacting every week. Um, I, you know, my wife will tell you, I uh, basically spent two and a half years on call 24 seven to the entire planet. Um, and uh, the one downside of that is that everybody has my cell phone number. Um, but this has was one of the most exciting things that I've ever participated in as an individual investigator, such great folks. So it was very important to the Food and Drug Administration that we actually show this works in a multi-center setting the way it uh, did at CHOP. Um, and so we were seeing um, uh, uh, CRCRI uh, 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 in induction in this uh, therapy for uh, you know the low 80s, 82%. Almost all of them flow MRD negative. I'll get into that very briefly. And once you went into remission, um, if you follow that, what was the likelihood of staying in remission? Um, so that's pretty good, actually. You know, in the in the uh, follow up that we have, we're going to be publishing longer term follow up very soon. Uh, at 24 months, 62% of the patients remaining in remission and most not going to transplant. That was an individual decision of investigators and families whether to go to transplant once they hit a remission after CAR T. Uh, overall survival uh, about what you would expect under these circumstances. Now, this is an interesting point. So <clears throat> there are basically three ways of measuring minimal residual disease or MRD. So in the, in the United States, it's all multi-parameter flow. And there's a great lab at the University of Washington, another great lab at Hopkins, and they've sort of taught uh, the US how to do this. We, we've always sent our samples to one of those two labs, mostly the University of Washington. It's sensitive to around 0.01%. Um, in the, in, that's the United States. In the EU, they use allele-specific PCR, so a molecular detection test um, that's about that sensitive, maybe slightly half-a-log more sensitive, maybe. And then more recently, uh, a commercial company has developed a, an assay that they call Clonaseq. Uh, Adaptive TCR does this, where they actually do high throughput next generation sequencing of every B cell in a marrow specimen and tell you if they see the uh, uh, clonal abnormalities that were associated with the disease. And so that's probably one and a half to two logs more sensitive uh, than flow. So what we did in this analysis, it's kind of fun, um, is we went back to marrow samples that we had in patients. And uh, these were all MRD negative by flow. And then we asked, are they MRD negative by this more sensitive NGS assay? And uh, the, the blue line, there weren't a lot of them, but the blue line is positive, the green line was negative. And so you see the uh, duration of remission curve here. And so it's 80% in patients who are double negative, negative for uh, flow, negative for NGS, and then 20% in uh, patients who are, this is at day 28, who are negative by flow, but positive by NGS. And this is, we've now, we're about to publish this information. We've, we've followed this out to three months and beyond. And this really holds up. Uh, I, I, you know, I think when I presented this initially at ASH in 2018, I'm like, uh, we got to see more data if this is for real, but I think it really holds up. Um, and basically, if you want to argue about who needs to be transplanted, you could make the argument and we're starting to think about this in, the, in this fashion, that patients uh, on the green line, well, sorry, patients on the blue line need to go to transplant because they have a high likelihood of relapsing. And patients on the green line, you know, when everybody can go to school, should go to school. And so uh, we'll see if that, you know, I think that it'll be great to see data from other cohorts to see if that's actually supported, but you know, it's a fairly strong finding and I, I have uh, confidence in it that I didn't have a couple of years ago. All right, safety. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, uh, there are significant toxicities associated with CAR T cell therapy. And everything in this whole field, in leukemia at least, is down to disease burden. But one of the principal toxicities is cytokine release syndrome. Um, and so grade three and four cytokine release syndrome get you to the ICU. I think that's the, the bottom line. Uh, <clears throat> low blood pressure, uh, the most common problem and uh, breathing difficulties that can get you on a, on a, on a vent. And there are other to uh, toxicities for sure. Some of these patients can be quite ill. Uh, we have a way of controlling this, um, but that's our major problem. We also see patients who have um, uh, cytopenias that can last longer than you would just expect with the initial chemotherapy called lymphodepleting chemotherapy that we give. Uh, there's a lot of concern about cerebral edema. We didn't see it in this study. 
but 27% of the patients had grade four cytokine release syndrome. And, and those are patients who are in the ICU on multiple pressors, quite ill for a median of eight days. They get better fast, uh, but they can be quite sick. Uh, and I'll show you how that's changed since FDA approval. So this approval happened in um, August, 2017. Um, and yes, it was in kids first. So, you know, given the mission of Alex's, I, I love saying that. Um, the, there were a variety of reasons why it happened that way, but the simplest reason is we made it for work. And, you know, of course we were dealing with kids with more uh, physiologic reserve than, than, than older adults. And I'm a pediatrician, so I'm not gonna apologize for that. This is actually the first time a CAR T cell therapy or an uh, engineered cell therapy or uh, gene therapy was approved in the United States and in pediatrics. Um, that, was, that was a big step forward. And I think uh, we need to think about that as we go forward in the CAR T field because that initial focus on pediatrics is not being sustained in what people are doing right now. They're, it's being sustained in great um, uh, academic centers uh, studies, super important, but the, the companies that actually have to commercialize these therapies and make them available worldwide, these companies have to remember to uh, 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 use their therapies in kids. Um, obviously, if you're developing something for pancreatic cancer, that's not going to be relevant, but there are opportunities to do a lot of other things in CAR-T for kids, and we'd like to see more of that. Now, since FDA approval, uh, this was an article that came out in Blood Advances uh, where they, they, there's a registry of patients who uh, got commercial CAR T cells and provide information like cytokine release syndrome. And so this isn't a study in the sense of everybody was enrolled and uh, the data were all monitored, but this is CIBMTR data, which is extremely high quality data for any, any kind of retrospective uh, uh, data set like this. They make a real effort to make sure that they're ascertaining the important toxicities and CRS and neurotoxicities are the two most important. And really what I wanna point out in this very complicated table, it's in there, um, it's in the paper, uh, is where the arrow is. And so grade three and four, uh, and uh, very rare, uh, there were no grade five toxicities in the Eliana study, but there, uh, there could be in the, uh, in the CIBMTR data set. But so greater than grade three um, CRS, you can see that um, there's a pretty significant difference, 16% versus 48% um, uh, high grade CRS. That's the real world. It's not that often that something gets better and not worse when more people do it. Um, uh, but this is really, I think, ref reflects the fact that patients are getting to CAR-T earlier with lower disease burden because it's all about the disease burden. <clears throat> now, patients do relapse after CAR-T cells. Um, the, you know, we started out at 100%, go down to 62%. I'll show you some longer follow-up data from one of our trials. Um, the, the patients can relapse with ALL that's still CD19 positive, which is our target. We think that's a T cell failure. They can also relapse to due to uh, CD19 escape. Now the, B cell, the ALL cells don't express CD19. There are a variety of mechanisms of that. Uh, we've studied this extensively. Um, RNA splicing is one mechanism. Gene deletion, much less frequently, but can happen. But basically what happens is we, we see these CD19 negative cells grow out. Oops, sorry about that. And what are we going to do about this? Well, there are a number of groups that are looking at this and, and uh, a secondary target, uh, CD22. Um, this, this, uh, this, this picture came from Alan Wayne. I don't want to take any credit for it. Um, but uh, CD22 is on 90% of ALL instead of 100% like CD19 is um, and uh, at diagnosis. And so com combining 19 and 22 is really an opportunity uh, to perhaps decrease, decrease this risk of antigen escape. Um, 22 works. Uh, the NIH, the NCI has done a great study, uh, uh, Nirali Shah, Terry Fry, um, showing about a 75% uh, remission induction. We've seen the same thing on our CD22 study, 75%, 74% remission induction. Um, <clears throat> Stanford had data in, in a at ASH uh, showing uh, complete responses, um, and uh, we're looking for longer follow-up in that, but they're doing the combined 1922. Uh, with a new method of, of manufacturing that's available at the center. Um, so this is moving along very quickly. There are a number of uh, studies that are looking at 19 plus 22. And the goal is to maintain the CR rate. I don't think it's going to make the CR rate any better. I think the CR, the, the patients who fail CR have T cells that fail. 
Uh, but I think there's an, a real opportunity to move that 62% in two years up to 80% um, using this approach. We'll see where you need the clinical trial data. So sp speaking a little bit more about cytokine release syndrome, this happens a few days after T-cell infusion, if it matters, it can happen a week or even rarely two weeks out, but that's probably just febrile neutropenia and not CRS. Uh, there is a clinical spectrum uh, from fever at one end, that gets you admitted to the hospital, it's a hypotension and an ICU trip at the other, I don't wanna minimize this. But what's really interesting is that the experience of getting CAR T cells and having this severe cytokine release syndrome has changed completely because severity scales with disease burden and we're getting patients earlier. Uh, and that means all the difference. So at CHOP, we've treated about 400 patients with CAR T. And what we see is that uh, in 2014, we were putting 40% of our patients in the ICU. And now it's like 12%. Why is that? Well, Maybe we're getting better at it. I'd like to think so, but not that much. I think the real difference is uh, doctors are referring for CAR T earlier. And it, this, it, you'll, you'll see the impact of, of uh, disease burden on outcome as well. Mechanistically, this turns out to be a interaction between T cells and the um, uh, reticular endothelial system, macrophages, dendritic cells. Um, this is why we didn't see this toxicity in mouse experiments uh, when we were doing preclinical development, because they didn't have these cells. Uh, these immunodeficient mouse models didn't have these cells. So um, the, the, one of the first observations that we made, this was Dave Tichy's suggestion at CHOP, was to look at a ferritin. He said these patients seem to him like HLH or macrophage activation syndrome. And <clears throat> sure enough, patients who went to the ICU, note that this is a log scale here, or semi-log scale, but the log scale here, um, have 100 times higher ferritin than patients who don't. And some of these patients, if you're used to taking care of HLH patients, have crazy ferritin levels, uh, 100 to 500,000. And that really does associate with uh, patients who require ICU level care. Um, if you look at cytokines, we've done a ton of cytokine analysis. And uh, I don't want to get into this in too much detail. People can ask me about it if they want. But basically, the cytokine uh, profile of patients who undergo CAR T therapy and have CRS looks like macrophage activation syndrome, looks like HLH. It is essentially a form of macrophage activation syndrome. So people who are now trying to separate MAS from HL, uh, MAS slash HLH from uh, cytokine release syndrome, I think are making a mistake. The acute typical CRS is a macrophage activation syndrome. In addition, there are patients who have late HLH that does not respond to the medication we usually use for typical CRS. And that is a different thing. Um, I, I completely acknowledge that, but that's rare and this is common. And so one of the things we noticed fairly early is again, log scale, uh, interferon gamma was 100 times higher in patients who went to the ICU that yes. Um, and uh, so, so was IL-6, interleukin-6, which isn't even made by T cells. This was a huge surprise to us. And really, this is the only reason there's a field of CAR-T is making that observation on the fly with the first patient that we ever treated who had terrible CRS, um, three pressors in the ICU, on an oscillator, 100% O2, 20 of nitric, and probably not gonna make it through the night until she was given a dose of an IL-6 uh, blocker, this drug called tocilizumab uh, that we refer to as TOSI. Um, and that turned her around immediately, like within hours. Um, and uh, I think arguably really transformed uh, the ability to give this uh, very powerful therapy safely. Um, has been helpful to, to, to multiple clinical trials to multiple patients, both adult and pediatric across the CAR-T field. We know that this rule applies in, um, uh, in uh, uh, CARs for hematologic malignancies. We're, we're, we don't know what the rules are in solid tumors yet because we don't have that many uh, CARs that have really been shown to have significant function in the solid tumor world. But this drug blocks the IL-6 receptor uh, and is now the only drug that was in, uh, is indicated for cytokine release syndrome. And this was an interesting experience that came up at the um, uh, FDA approval in the FDA approval process, uh, as I saw it from the outside, where <clears throat> the FDA is like, well, we have to have a uh, toxicity management protocol. And we said, yep, this is what we use. And they're like, well, you can't have a drug that isn't indicated for the thing you're going to use it for if this is a commercial therapy. And it's like, okay. So essentially what they did, we had uh, nothing to do with this, but what they did is they 
you know, I'm oversimplifying a very complicated process, but they essentially handed the data to Roche, the company that makes the IL-6 blocker. They handed it back to the FDA and the FDA gave them an indication in this area. They did not perform a study uh, to get an indication for tocilizumab. And I thought that was extremely innovative. I don't know the details of how it worked, but it impressed the hell out of me. Um, so this is the, the mainstay of treatment. Um, if people are interested in more details, you start with tocilizumab, but you can use steroids and you can use other cytokine blockers as well. But the, the many patients will get better just with a dose or two of tocilizumab with or without a very short course of steroids that most of the patients with severe CRS are controlled with this approach. And this is the kind of thing we see in a perfect world, high spiking fever, I apologize for the Fahrenheit degrees. This is from my friend at an adult hospital. Uh, then uh, maintain fever. This is just before they start dropping their blood pressure. You give them tocilizumab and can often be shut off as you can see within hours. Uh, and that's the way it works when it works best. Disease burden, again, uh, so this is just percent of blasts in the marrow is one crude measure of disease burden in ALL patients. And you can see um, that uh, patients who have over 50, 40 or 50% uh, disease burden go to the ICU. That's yes here. Patients who don't uh, generally don't go to the ICU. We see three patients who, di who didn't go even though they had high disease burden. Two of them were uh, did not have a response. And this one had, um, I guess, a lucky time of it. Um, so we know if you check disease burden after the uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy and just before T-cell infusion, we, you know, if you have over 40%, we know there's a high likelihood of going to the ICU and we tell parents that. On the other hand, if you have, you know, 5% marrow, uh, that's something for a transplanter would be a, a devastating number that you would never consider doing a transplant on. That from a toxicity point of view is fairly easy in the CAR-T world. And because of this issue of uh, earlier referral, uh, so this is heresy. I'm sorry for folks who think this is a terrible idea, but almost all of our patients are treated, given their CAR T cell infusions in the outpatient clinic, over 90%. Uh, there's only specific reasons that we admit patients for CAR T therapy. And these days, totally different from five years ago, but these days, 40 to 50% of the patients are never admitted to the hospital, ever. So they're not going to the ICU, they're not going to the hospital. They're getting their, their cells in the clinic. And in, in that group of patients, we're explaining to the parents that we're not worried about their kid because they're not sick. And they're like, how can we get a, a clinical response without being terribly ill? And it's like, you know, if you have a lower disease burden, you don't need it. So we have looked at the issue of giving um, uh, tocilizumab preemptively. So this was a trial that was, was just, just published a couple of weeks ago in JCO um, where we were testing a preemptive approach we enrolled 70 patients. We got 15 patients who had 40% blasts. You can't predict that when you enroll the patient because they're gonna get bridging therapy and lymphopleting chemotherapy. So we, we measure their uh, blast percentage right before T-cell infusion, which I think is the best time to measure it. People could disagree with that. And then if they had that high disease burden, those 15 patients, we were looking for a decrease of a third, uh, I mean, of uh, two thirds. So we, we want, wanted to, uh, sorry, put it this way. We wanted uh, only a third of the patients to have grade four CRS. We thought that having five or less than five out of 15 of these patients would be clinically meaningful in terms of not having grade four CRS. So five, uh, less than five, grade four, uh, all the rest, grade three or less. That's what we were looking for. Uh, that was the end point of the study. Uh, we gave a single dose of tocilizumab as soon as they got a fever. Um, we, we defined what a fever was, um, and our goal was to preempt that grade four uh, CRS, and then we just treated them like any other patient. We, we gave them whatever CRS management they needed after that. <clears throat> so this is a study where, where you can sort of see how patients do, uh, again, with this, high, with this disease burden thing. So the, the best over resp overall response in the study was 97%. Um, now, I have seen uh, presentations that talk about uh, uh, real world uh, data that uh, from a, a, a small number of centers saying that over 5% uh, disease, you don't see responses. That's true of blinitumumab. It's not true of Kimraya. That's not what we see. That's not what we've seen in any of our, our uh, studies. I can't address that question in the Eliana study, which is the registration trial, because we didn't do a pre-infusion marrow in that study, but we always do on a job. So if you look at patients who are over 40%, who are truly refractory, there was an 87% CRCRI rate in those patients. They go into remission. Now, their longer-term outcome is not as good, and I'll show you that. That's important. 
But in terms of going into remission, to say that patients over 5% don't go to into remission very often is just not correct. Uh, we know that's not true. Um, lower tumor burden, 100% CR, CRI, but in all fairness, that includes patients who have less than 5% blasts um, uh, after the lymphadenopenia chemotherapy. So they're already in remission. So getting into remission when you start there, even though you might have leukemia, uh, is not an accomplishment. So I wouldn't make too much of that 100%. We saw the, the reduction below one third in grade four CRS, uh, less than five out of 15. We met that study endpoint. And then we had some, a lot of safety concerns. Like, would it interfere with uh, complete response rate? Nope, didn't. Would it interfere with car expansion because you need IL-6 for some reason? Nope, you don't. And we knew that in mice because there's no IL-6 in mice. Um, and did it, it impact car persistence? Or did it impact ICANs, which is the fancy term for neurotoxicity? None of the above. Didn't see it. So what we're seeing in this, in this, you know, again, the impact of, of tumor burden. So 20%, um, uh, sorry, 27% grade four CRS uh, in the high tumor burden cohort, which was considerably less uh, than what we saw previously in our historic controls. Um, and then uh, only 4% in patients with low tumor burden. And this is exactly what we see over and over and over again. Um, so that's, that's the impact of, of, uh, of tumor burden on toxicity. But there's also an impact on outcome. As I said to you, uh, they're still going into remission 87% of the time, even over 40% blast. That's not the problem. So this is the overall survival curve. And what you see, this is the low tumor burden cohort, and this is the high tumor burden cohort. So um, I don't have this on the slide, and I'll put it on uh, for the next time. But uh, if you look at two-year EFS in these patients, the low tumor burden co cohort was almost 80%, and the high tumor bur burden, bur ugh, burden cohort was around 35%. There's a big difference in maintenance of remission. And a lot of that is due to CD19 escape, which gets back to that issue of doing hopefully co combination therapy with CD19 and 22. The other argument that you can make is that this would interfere with B-cell aplasia, which is our measure of functional persistence. If you don't have B-cells, you still got CAR cells is the way we look at this. And you see there's no difference at all. So we're not interfering with the function of the cells by giving that extra dose of, uh, that early dose of uh, tocilizumab. So we, we think that that is a useful strategy for patients that you're concerned about toxicity in. Uh, I think there's been a lot of opportunity to build consensus in the field. Um, uh, the, uh, a year ago, we published a consensus grading system that I think everybody's agreeing on and that we want the companies all to use so that we don't have multiple grading systems uh, that are, are uh, center-based and uh, make the ability to compare uh, therapies and commercial therapies to each other very difficult. We're developing consensus guidelines. This was just published by the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer. And this was cooperative with a number of other groups, including the American Society for Transplant and Cell Therapy and, and ASH. Um, so we're really trying to get together as a field and talk about this. And if you can possibly imagine what a cat herding exercise that is, uh, that's what we're dealing with. This, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna acknowledge the fact that there is a consensus CRS grading scale that looks at fever, hypotension, and hypoxia and is very clinically based. Now, from a uh, toxicity standpoint, we know a lot about CRS. We can predict it, we understand the biology, we know how to treat it almost all the time, not always, but all, almost all the time. Neurotoxicity is a big question mark. Um, fortunately, the neurotoxicity of this particular product is, is quite low, and we're not seeing cerebral edema um, hardly ever in these patients. We've had one really significant uh, case of cerebral edema in uh, the patients, that, or the 400 patients that we've treated at CHOP. Um, can't get into this in detail, but basically it falls into several buckets. There's delirium, which is associated with drugs, high fever, and um, uh, goes away as soon as your fever gets better. But there's true encephalopathy, which is absolutely a CAR-T um, uh, toxicity and is what we see in uh, Tisogen, Leclisel, or Kimraya. Seizures from time to time, but that's mostly in patients with prior methotrexate leukoencephalopathy and seizures in the past. Generally, this gets get better on its own. We don't have to treat it. We don't give these patients steroids, almost without exception. The real concern is cerebral edema, which is seen more commonly in CD28 cars. It, it, it ended the Juno rocket trial, which used that CD8 20, CD28 car design. Uh, there's also a toxicity grading scale for neurotoxicity, which is infinitely more complicated, but still usable uh, clinically, absolutely. And the, the term now is uh, immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome or ICANS. Uh, 
I think we spent more time talking about that acronym than we did actually about the grading scale, but we all agreed on ICANN. So when you hear people talking about, that's what they're talking about. Now, I'm almost, uh, I'm out of time here. So um, uh, who gets a transplant? Boy, does that differ from center to center. We're trying not to transplant most of our patients, even though I'm a bone marrow transplanter by trade. I'd love to stop the, the need for ALL transplant in most patients and transfer that to CAR-T, which in that group of patients is much better tolerated with much lower risk. And so 80 to 90% of our patients don't go to transplant. Um, who does? Well, if you were sent to our, you know, since most of our patients come from outside our center, if you were sent to our center to get into remission so you can go to transplant, that's cool. Uh, go for it. Uh, it's actually, it's an awesome way to go to transplant because it's much less tolerant, much less uh, toxic than six months of chemotherapy leading to a transplant when you finally get MRD negativity and a fungal infection. Uh, if they're MRD positive, I talked about that. If they have early B cell recovery, we argue about what to do. Um, uh, if they're if they got a car, went into remission, relapsed, got a car, went into remission again, well, we can't do it with car. We didn't do it the first time. That pa patient needs to go to a transplant. And then we argue endlessly about MLL rearrangement. And it's a reasonable argument to be made that these patients may need to go to transplant. Whether it improves their outcome, unknown to me. Um, we're talking about upfront. Can't talk about it. Don't have time. But basically, uh, the idea is if you have Refractory ALL is shown by being MRD positive after a couple of cycles of chemotherapy. We're going to take that patient straight to CART, um, uh, possibly avoid the need for a bone marrow transplant. And also, if this works, big if, we got to see, uh, uh, that would be a situation where patients would be getting several months of chemotherapy CAR and then be done, not get um, two plus years of, of uh, chemotherapy and uh, 20 shots of methotrexate to the spinal fluid. That could really change things a lot, but that's a big if, that's a big lift. We're not there yet. This works in CNS disease. I'm not gonna be able to talk about it in any more uh, detail than this. It clears CNS disease, it clears blasts in the spinal fluid, it clears uh, um, uh, sugar coating of the cranial nerves, it clears um, patients with actual overt parenchymal disease and very low relapse rate, 2% uh, 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 relapse rate in uh, patients uh, treated with CTL-019. So we get immunosurveillance in the spinal fluid and in the CNS. I think that's incredibly important. And we know the cells go there. We can see them with our eyes and we can see them with our assays. Approved in a lot of the first world, not uh, elsewhere. Um, EU, UK, Canada, Australia, Israel, Japan. Um, and now there are multiple new products getting FDA approved in the United States. We'll also move to these other countries. Um, I'm not gonna have time to talk about auto versus aloe. So if I have questions about that, then people can ask me. And this is just a, a, a visualization of where we were about a year ago um, uh, with uh, how many companies are building various car products and how close they are to FDA approval with now four green dots, not two in the center as being actually marketed. And Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner is talking about um, uh, five, 10, five to 10 gene therapy products being approved uh, per year in 2025 and moving forward. So this is a huge deal. And again, let's make sure that pediatrics is represented at this table because we were the first dot in the middle by God and uh, we deserve some attention. I'll, I'll stop for questions um, at 50 minutes instead of 45. So I apologize for that. Uh, just acknowledging all the folks who have been part of the process, Carl June, leading the cell therapy group at uh, uh, investigation group at Penn, uh, the folks in my lab, Dave Tichy and a number of others, Bruce Levine and Don Siegel who make the cells, the CHOP clinical staff, including Shannon Mott and a bunch of other amazing folks that I have the great, great honor to work with at CHOP. Um, and then an innumerable other people, the intensive care unit CHOP, I have to make a specific call out to them because they have really been <laughs> incredible in taking care of these kids as we learn together on the fly with the first patient and the subsequent patients, um, how to actually do this brand new therapy and deal with physiology that nobody's ever seen before. Funders of this work, um, the foundations, uh, including Alex's uh, who have supported this work um, and just all the, all the uh, patients and families who actually have the, the willingness to do these sort of cutting edge therapies. And with that, uh, we have 10 minutes and I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Jay, we can't hear you. 
Still nothing. Okay, unmuting myself. Uh, maybe I'll grab a question or two. Um, so uh, I, I said that it doesn't discriminate on cytogenetics, but what about hypodiploid? Uh, we don't have enough patients to answer that question. Um, we didn't exclude the patients, but we don't have enough patients to answer that question. Um, and so uh, Amanda Denofia Chop has is doing a orphan indication trial um, for um, ALL patients, and one of the major orphan indications is hypodiploid. It's also looking at CNS patients to try to avoid radiation in those patients. Um, so sort of newer uses. Um, uh, and so any hypodiploid patient, regardless of their response, including MRD negative, because they all do so poorly, um, is eligible for this trial. And maybe we can have a better answer for a specific uh, chromosomal um, abnormality. Um, can you address the variability in discussion to use CAR to bridge a transplant with close monitoring after CAR? Uh, you know, how do we avoid a transplant? Talked about this a little bit. So what we actually do without getting into a ton of detail is we monitor these patients extremely closely. We're checking their B cells, CD19 in the peripheral blood every month. We're also looking at their marrow at, even in the commercial setting at at least month three and possibly month six. If you get hematogones back at month three, you're gonna get B cell recovery. And at that point, we would either recommend a transplant or we would consider reinfusion, which we do in a number of patients uh, who look like they're or uh, getting their B cells back or definitely are getting their B cells back. Uh, Jay, are you, uh, are you unmuted at this point? Okay. Um, so, although CARs penetrate CNS, if you have a CNS positive patient, would you consider IT chemo early after CAR infusion? Nope, absolutely not. Under no circumstances, wouldn't. Those T cells are floating around in the spinal fluid waiting to kill ALL. And the worst thing I could do is dump methotrexate on them. So I would not do that. Now, very important, patient gets CAR T, um, uh, uh, is um, uh, assessed on day 28 and still has disease in the spinal fluid. Um, so you have two choices there. You can say that's a treatment failure and you can give them IT and say, okay, car didn't work. That's, that's a, a reasonable thing to do. But if it's just a cell, if that patient is just CNS 2A, I'd wait four weeks. I'd check another uh, spinal tap. And I've seen several patients, we have seen, our group has seen several patients who have a cell or two cells um, that uh, uh, a month later didn't have any cells, uh, ALL cells, and therefore you know, were in remission. And that study that I showed you, that best overall response rate of 97% included two of those patients who had minimal level CNS disease at uh, day 28 and nothing a month later. So I personally would uh, wait, but if they have CNS3 disease, then the disease failed. Sorry, the, the, the CAR T cell failed and they should not um, get, uh, they should get intrathecal and they should move on to other therapy because we didn't do the job for them. Um, so I think that's very important. On the other hand, it's really important for them to get intrathecal therapy going into CART because we want obviously that CNS disease under control. Does it have to be uh, CNS uh, one? No, it does not. But it, a thousand blasts in the CSF, that's not a great idea. So we want, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll treat a, a kid up to about 50 blasts or so. Uh, it's pretty high, but we'll do it. But mostly it's, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's CNS 2A and low CNS 3. But I can think of a kid who had uh, significant CNS cranial nerve involvement um, and uh, who went into remission and remains in remission five years later. Um, all right, evidence for, uh, or lack of evidence for epitope spreading. Um, so it's all lack. Uh, we don't have good assays for this. We have no evidence that it's happening. We take CD19 escape as being an indication that there isn't epitope spreading. Um, so uh, it's not like we've formally looked for it and can exclude it, which is actually from an experimental part of, point of view, fairly hard to do. So I really appreciate this question because it's the most common question we get from families. If a patient has little to no CRS, is that indicative that the T cells are not going to be successful? No, it's not. So a patient with low disease burden can have no toxicity whatsoever. They can have uh, a little bit of a headache and some muscle aches you know, on day five, uh, 
that, uh, but no fever. They can have a low grade fever that doesn't require admission or they can have a real fever that requires admission to the hospital, but you don't need to have CRS for a response. On the other hand, if you have a patient with 60% blasts and absolutely no CRS, that's absolutely a patient that I'd be worried. You're not gonna get a response without at least a fever in that patient and probably more significant CRS. So it depends on, um, uh, depends on uh, the, uh, on the disease burden for the patient. Question about solid tumors, and you know, unfortunately in the time that I have available, I'd say broadly speaking, there's some interesting targets that are coming out there. Uh, GD2 is, is coming back. I uh, wasn't impressed by GD2, but I feel like it's coming back for neuroblastoma. Uh, B7H3 looks really interesting. EGFR, um, let's see. Uh, delivery probably matters a lot in CNF, CNS tumors, but the bottom line across the field is we've seen nothing like the very significant uh, uh, efficacy in uh, patients with um, uh, heme malignancies that we see in, uh, we're not seeing that in the solid tumor field. Uh, and that has to do with trafficking and getting the T cells into the tumor. Um, <clears throat> so plan to eventually use CAR-T as frontline therapy. I think we, we can get it, the closest we'll ever get to this is probably that 1721 study where patients are MRD positive. Um, no one's ever gonna get CAR-T as the first thing because obviously at that point they have a high blast count. If CAR-T is really great, and especially if you can turn it off because one of the long-term toxicities, which I did not mention is hypogammaglobulinemia. If you don't have B cells, you don't have IgG and you need that replaced. I do not want to miss that. And I apologize for not having a slide on that. And so um, uh, in, it, I think the closest we would ever come is, is and that's way above, uh, ahead of where we are right now is uh, a, a brief induction followed by CAR-T. Um, and let's see now. We have a patient lost B cell aplasia, which means no CAR T function, four and a half months post Kim Raya. Um, she re oh yeah, I know this patient. Uh, she regained B cell aplasia at 5.5 months. So in other words, the CAR T cells appeared to stop working and then they started again. Do I have a biological explanation for this? No, no idea. Have we seen this a couple of times? Yeah. Do we wonder when in our own center, whether there's some assay issue? Uh, uh, the, you know, the, the CD19 assays are not really designed for really low B cell numbers. They're definitely not designed to be positive negative. Um, and we, we draw a line at 3% as being positive, which is somewhat arbitrary, but this was above that line. So that's really weird. Um, and uh, if they had hematogones, then it's, it's real. I don't know if they did or they didn't. Um, but the bottom line is that most of the time, if you're at 3%, uh, a month later, you're at 5%, and a month later, you're at 10%, and that's real B-cell recovery, and we would do something about that. But if a patient went back into B-cell aplasia, then we wouldn't do anything to get them there because they're already there. Um, I'm going to stop with this great question from Greg. Um, can you comment on long-term effects? So <clears throat> I, I don't see much. So what I see uh, is um, uh, hypogammaglobulinemia requiring replacement. So that's a thing. Emily Whitehead, our first patient, whose name I can use because she's in the public domain, is almost nine years out and still gets Hyzentra. So that's a long-term toxicity. Um, uh, we see in those patients, we see sinusitis every once in a while treated with oral antibiotics. We're not seeing hospitalizations. Um, we're seeing lots of toxicity associated with the transplants that the patients got before they came to us, just like everybody else sees. They mostly get TBI and we see toxicities associated with that. Um, but I think there's really now emerging an effort just like there was in chemotherapy you know, 20 plus years ago to really start looking at this in a more uh, systematic fashion. And really, you know, right now we're not surveilling these patients the way we should be for long-term side effects, especially neurocognitive long-term side effects. So I think there's a real opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to do that. Um, and uh, there are groups being put together to do that very thing. So I would regard that as being, there's nothing obvious to us, but we know from your work, Greg, and others in this field that if you don't look, you don't see, uh, and we ain't looking that hard right now. Um, you know, we've been pleasantly surprised that these kids are still alive, to be honest with you, and now we've got to be, be doing this. These patients are going to survivorship groups, but what really needs to be done is system systematic research in this group of patients. So I couldn't agree more that that's a, a crying need in a group of patients where at least we don't have a sense that the toxicity burden is terrible. Um, and uh, 
Kim, thank you for that comment uh, in the chat. So at this point, even though there are unanswered questions, um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, hopefully they can, they can send this chat transcript to me and I'll be happy to put together an email answering some of these other questions uh, for the group since now we're uh, one minute over the hour. Want to thank everybody for these fantastic questions, many of which I haven't gotten. Oh my God, I haven't gotten to a bunch of them. I'm sorry. I promise. I'll write an email. Um, and also just thank uh, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation uh, for their unbelievable support uh, for us, uh, at, uh, for the whole childhood cancer enterprise at uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia um, and for some of this work as well. Uh, it's just such a great group to go to. Uh, work with um, and it's such a pleasure to speak uh, to this uh, to their seminar series. So thanks very much for everybody's attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Grupp, for your time today and for everyone for joining and all these great questions. We will uh, contact you offline with the uh, rest of all of these questions. And um, thank you so much. This was really excellent. My pleasure. Uh, thanks. Thanks again. Have a good day, everyone.